Hey, everybody, it's Tyler, host of the Tyler Knows Everything podcast, where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. Y'all, I got my first sponsor. I didn't really put this out. He kind of slid into my DMs, but do uh, you remember Ty Kudrain from episode five? If you haven't, go back and check that episode out. He's a really cool guy, and he deeply believes in what we're doing here and the content that we're producing, so he graciously volunteered to sponsor some of the studio costs that we have here. My guest today is Brian Shajeri. And Brian is a Coast Guard veteran who works in cybersecurity and has about 90 outfits from 13 different eras uh, doing reenactments from everything from the Alamo, the Civil War, Vietnam, and everything in between. Super interesting guy. I think you're going to like this episode. Please welcome Brian Shajeri. Tyler knows everything. All right, everybody. We're here with Brian. Sh- you say it. Should Jerry Brian works? So I think that's usually what people. Yeah. Tend Have you ever to seen the protest sign that says uh, br- uh, "We we want brains" or Brian's or yeah. more Brian's and bombs or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've, yeah. They meant to say brains, but they spelled Brian's. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. More brains and bombs. Or so more Brian's what, what nationality is your last name? So my father is from Iran. He came here in 1978. Uh, you know, right when the government over there wasn't really doing too well, mm-hmm. they uh, dad dad came here on a on a student visa, and uh, so he came over here, studied in the United States, met my mother who is from Beaumont, Texas, in a discotheque in Los Angeles, California, and here oh. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exciting, man. Yeah. So yeah, you're the cybersecurity development with uh, American Bureau of Shipping. Yes, I am. And yep. then. Uh, veteran of the Coast Guard. Yep, yep. Still in the reserves? I'm still, still a reservist. So, okay. yeah, I don't get out of prison for about another eight more years. With oh, that. okay. <laughs> nice. And also Beaumont's most eligible bachelor. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the goal of this podcast is to get you the most qualified DMs. Most straight, qualified. Straight absolutely. to your inbox. Yep. And I use the term qualified because I, I, I heard a joke one time on your social media that uh, weren't you kind of, you were chatting with a girl, I think it might have been on social media. And, you know, you're kind of getting to know each other, seeing if you want to meet up. And she said, I, uh, no, I think you're too qualified for me or something like, are you? <laughs> I get 90% of the time, I'm sorry, but you're overqualified and you're too successful for me. Yeah. Which, what, like, what does that mean? I, it, I thought that's what girls were looking for. No clue. I, I'm, I'm like, when I see that, I usually have to read it four times to actually comprehend what I just saw. Yeah. Sometimes I'll be like, LOL, okay. And they're like, no, I'm serious. I can't further talk to you because you're just too... You're just too successful in life, and I'm mm-hmm. like, what does that even mean? One of them actually opened up and said, um, uh, "What see what she said? She was, you know, just referring that she needs a complete wreck in her life for a partner." And I'm just, to me, that I don't know, boggles me. But yeah, you know, you have some that like the drama, and yeah. there's, uh, you know, there's guys like me that like I don't want to argue. It's not, it's not fun to argue. Because I'm a fixer. Like, if something's wrong, I'm just like, oh, well, we can just do this and fix it. And Absolutely. Then, and then we don't have to argue. Yeah. But they like that excitement. You know, I guess you, so. If you look at some of the television shows that a lot of women like, it's, you know, it's, it's full of drama. It's full yeah. of fights and, and affairs and, and this, that, and the other. So maybe that's what I, yeah. yeah, what the excitement is. Yeah, I guess so. But they're not going to find it with me. I mean, I don't want to tell them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, some, sometimes you can find the right person that thinks success is exciting. Right. And, you, you know, you have that. It's all about finding that balance. Absolutely. Right? So with the nature of your career, you know, we can't talk about specific details with right. some of the security things, but we can talk about cybersecurity in more of a comprehensive Absolutely. Uh, atmosphere. So Absolutely. What are some things that the average person should be worried about? You know, I'll be going, I'll go to the airport and sign sign into the public Wi-Fi and then, you know, maybe Venmo a friend some money, get on the PayPal, do some banking. What am I do what what should I be afraid of? Well, okay. The weight. The way I explain it to people, first of all, cybersecurity, I grew up in the military world with cyber. Cyber is very DOD sounding like Department of Defense. You know, it's, you know, when we hear that, we think of all these great computers, you know, at the Pentagon or something. I like to say information security. It encompasses everything in our daily lives that are electronic, like you just talked about, your your Wi-Fi on your phone, your, your uh, cell phone that you carry around with you, um, your social media, everything is information security now. Um, so having basic security mindsets about your personal life will really get you a long way. So not connecting to public Wi-Fi um, is is really what I like to compare to uh, when you send a friend a letter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you put it in an envelope. That's secure web surfing in a way. If you write it on a postcard and say, 
hey, John, I'm going to be here on this exact day. Come meet me and Tyler here at this exact hour. So now you just kind of broadcast the whole world where you're going to be. If you send that card from somewhere else in the world, you send it through the mail, and people can read that openly. Right. That's essentially what information security is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's taking steps to prevent uh, further issues. So if you're a businessman that travels, you should probably get maybe a VPN. Absolutely. Like a, a, I highly recommend VPN. VPN stands for virtual private network. network? That's okay. correct. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I have one on my phone. I have one on my home internet. Uh, if you uh, Google them, you know, you can easily pull up some really good reputable brands that are out there that you can use. Yeah. So. I, I saw a commercial for one the other day. It was just a few bucks a month, yeah. you know, for a membership. And, yeah. and I guess you, you log on just like you would with the regular internet and then you switch over to the VPN. Yep. Or and it doesn't take much. It's, it's not expensive at all. And, right. you know, if you spend a couple extra bucks a month, then, uh, you know, making sure your, your personal life's secured, then absolutely, you know, you're good to go. A lot of corporations are going to that now. Um, mm-hmm. Most large companies will require you to log in to a VPN. Right. I'm sure people out there listening right now are thinking to myself, oh, yeah, I have to take this extra step that to me is, is just an extra couple of seconds out of a day. But what you're doing is you're really protecting your footprint. And that's really the most important thing when it comes to anything when you touch the Internet. You, you've, you've got to erase your footprints. Right. So. And now more than ever, we've seen cybersecurity take a role in warfare. Yes. And just recently we learned that uh, with the, the things that are going on uh, in the past week with Iran. Yes. Uh, yeah. So they it supposedly are confirmed maybe shot down a drone. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're trying to determine if it was international waters or not. And then uh, did they attempt a cyber attack? After that, there's a lot of speculation. Some, you know, there's been a lot of people asking me this question. Mm-hmm. And right now, the best answer I can give is cyber warfare is a very um, uh, secretive thing that, mm-hmm. that that will always be that way. So there's probably not a lot of information that we're getting. Yeah. There's probably not a stuff we're going to know about for probably 20 to 30 years from now. Yeah. And that's just how it goes. And I think for sure we know that China uses the internet for corporate espionage. Oh, absolutely. For, uh, the United into, States is China's biggest economic competitor. Right. So and so they're they're looking into, you know, business deals before they happen, mm-hmm. you know, looking for a merger, anything they can do to get a leg up on absolutely. what's going on in the business world, uh, maybe even look at patents and things like that. Absolutely. Or, anything that's proprietary property of yeah, another intellectual company. property. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, for example, I think when, when SEAL Team 6 crashed the helicopter, we had a stealth helicopter yeah. that even the SEAL Team didn't see until that, you know, that yeah. morning or whatever. Had. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the, 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 they had to leave it there. or they, Well, they, they blew it up, but there was like a tail. Yeah. And I think that next morning you could see a bunch of guys like carting off parts and pieces of the tail. And supposedly they sold it, you know, sold it to China or something like that. Yeah, so absolutely. They, so they're going to kind of, yeah. I guess they want to reverse engineer it. Yeah. And try. We, you know, we... We did the same thing to the Soviets during the Cold War. Yeah. Um, a lot of my graduate work focused around the Cold War. And uh, the Soviets did a lot of stuff to us. You know, they would take our stuff and we'd take theirs and reassemble it. You know, if we had a, a defector come from the Soviet Union, then we'd look at the, you know, jet they flew on. And it's it's essentially the same thing with cyber warfare. Yeah. It, what was your academic path? So I, uh, I uh, graduated with my undergraduate degree in criminal justice. And back then in the early thousands, I was studying what was a very – a uh, very young and immature um, cyber criminal program, and it, yeah. like what cyber crime was, we didn't even know what the word cyber meant. In so, what year was that? I went to college about sixty thousand years ago, um, <laughs> <laughs> from two thousand to two thousand five. Okay, so since it was technology, do you feel like some of the things you learned and you know totally two- outdated? Yeah, it doesn't even make sense now. Right. I mean, you know, back then we were operating uh, tower computers. I haven't seen one of those in so long. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> CD-ROMs and three and a half floppies. Yeah. That's, that's and, the thing of the past. You know, what version of Windows were you, you know, oh, you, yeah. you probably had to learn every minute detail about that version of Windows that's completely useless now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can tell um, any first date I go on, anything they want to know about Windows 95 to XP. Yeah. The board, that may be the problem. <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> yeah, but that's the interesting, interesting thing about your arena is that some people, once you have a law degree, you know, you're good. You don't really need to continue education that much, you know. Right. Uh, but with technology, my goodness. I you- had to. I mean, you know, the military taught me stuff about cybersecurity. I went to a lot of courses for it. But then I decided I need to get a graduate degree in this. So okay. I just finished a few months ago my um, graduate work um, in, in cybersecurity. I now have my master's in it. And I have a certification in information system security. Mm-hmm. You know, what that means is 
to sum it up, um, one of the first classes I took two years ago, they said, everything you learn today from here until you get that piece of paper, tomorrow it's going to be outdated. Yeah. It's just like buying a laptop. With right. When you're in the cybersecurity business, when you get that degree, okay, that's great. But now it's time for you to start staying on top of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with me, I, I landed a career that uh, with a really good company that's focused around maritime cybersecurity. And, um, and, and, and I also came from a very strong background with the military that was cyber-oriented as well. So. Yeah. When the ships are out in the middle of the ocean, do they have internet? They can have internet through satellite access. Okay. And um, right now, maritime ships in the commercial domain, you know, not speaking military, their right. biggest risks, their biggest vulnerabilities lie – um, and, and, and two things, it's wireless internet that, that they may have on board and that wireless is ultimately connected to the satellite system. Yeah. So these guys will pull into port and they'll have their wi is just wide open. Yeah. And yeah. It, it really irks me when I hear that. So. What are they using for communication? Because we, we've had ships for, you know, decades and they weren't using Wi-Fi back then. So I guess no. are they using a different system for just radios and things like yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, your standard radios are required to be on board, your okay. VHF, all that stuff. So. Yeah. So like when they're they're communicating with a port, that's via... Historically, sat- well, historically, sometimes radio and then satellite. Sat well, phone, so. maybe? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's exciting. So um, we talked about the... The Iran cyber attack. I know mm-hmm. there was a lot of speculation with Russia and you know Russian influencing the the election, which they they weren't really involved with changing votes or hacking into ballot machines, but it was more about creating bots on the internet to push more of one side of information Absolutely. versus the other. Yeah, and I I generally stay away from the political spectrum, but yeah, and, will... and not to not to comment on one, yeah, political, yeah, yeah. but. The way that they did it uh, was something that had never been seen before no. because nobody had used social media in the past for campaigns. Like when in the Bush election, it wasn't really you yeah. know, people weren't on MySpace it, talking it, about it the was, presidential election. It was the Facebook back then, and it was only for college students, right? Yeah, <laughs> and so it wasn't really it was a good in, old days. Yeah, because <laughs> I remember uh, you know the election in two thousand and two thousand four. Uh, it, it was just commercials, yeah, you know, TV commercials trying to persuade you. Nothing on the internet. Now you have. Everybody from a teenager up to grandparents' age yeah. that are get- that are on Facebook, right? And uh, you know, it, it's that's an interesting situation. The Russians utilized what is known as social engineering. Social engineering is me coming up to Tyler and saying, "Hey, I bet I can figure out what your password is to your computer." And that's uh, you know, what's your favorite football team, or you know, knowing something about you that I could probably attribute to your password. Right. And you know, you can you can easily figure it out. Uh, social engineering. You can also I can call your 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 workplace and say, hey, this is so-and-so in IT. I need your password to log in real quick. What the Russians did is they essentially took um, a very vulnerable platform, Facebook, and they um, circulated false information. That's that's an old Cold War tactic. You know, uh, misinformation is yeah. something we've always used uh, throughout the intelligence community for years. Because mm-hmm. um, so, you can throw somebody off a trail. Absolutely, or, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's 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 just something that 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 has been around since – the early ages of yeah. warfare. I guess if you if you're planning attack over here, you say, "Hey, we're going to be over there. Yeah, we're coming for you. Yeah, but I'm, we're really over here. I mean, misinformation. Yeah. You can go back to the to the U.S. Civil War when during the um, Battle for Yorktown and the Peninsula Campaign, one Confederate general would take a train load of troops and circle them around. Oh, so right. the Union troops thought that there was just a ton of Confederate troops coming in. So you know that's misinformation. That was 1862. Yeah. So. And the scary thing about cyber warfare is that it doesn't maybe cost a lot of money, whereas like no. nuclear weapons cost a lot of money. Right. Uh, aircraft carriers cost like we have more aircraft carriers than any other country combined. You Absolutely. Know, if, you, if you combine every country in the world, we still have outnumber them. Yeah. Uh, but with cyber warfare, you just need you know guys in a room and a laptop and a, and a, and a good internet connection. So does North Korea have? Cyber warfare because it I'm seems sure they to be do. cheaper. I I, guess. I, absolutely, yeah. it's you know cyber warfare does not require this advanced technology. It really doesn't. It's it can be simple depending on what your goal is. And if you're really really well trained, you know what you're doing, you got the motivation. You know these guys will do it. Um, yeah. And another thing too, it's borderless. There's no borders. Right. You know you can't attribute a certain state or a non-state actor to this stuff. Yeah. Well, you know you brought up the Civil War and. Uh, the 1800s, that's kind of a hobby of yours is <laughs> collecting. Uh, tell us what you collect and what you, you know, participate in. I am a man of, of a lot of hobbies. People will ask me, do you ever have spare time? And my answer is usually no. 
Um, right. I, I think I'm way ahead of my time as far as retirement goes because I like to I like to do a lot of things in my spare time. You know, I'm a bagpiper, obviously. I, yeah, I, so I've been doing I, that for I've years. Seen, I've seen the bagpipes. I've seen the uh, antique vintage war uniforms yep. and memorabilia. I've seen the model airplanes. Yes. I, and, yeah, I do all that stuff. <laughs> uh, and then painting. Also, yes. Yeah, like, I do a lot of oil paints as well. Yeah, uh, oil paints of ships. Yeah, and just anything. Airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. I have been collecting stuff since I was about ten years old, and I'm one of those funny people that they call reenactors. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I cover such a wide span of uh, of of time eras. I think somebody asked me the other day, "Well, how many time eras do you collect in?" You know, and I said probably about thirteen, and I have probably close to 90 different outfits and yeah, wow. some of the older stuff I actually make by hand. <laughs> oh, wow. So <laughs> based it's off like, originals. Yeah. Uh, what's one of your, if you had to pick a favorite era, what would that Probably be? my favorite is the 1830s, the, 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 the Texas revolution era, because yeah, okay. the fashions for men were so diverse here in Texas. Mm-hmm. There was, there was, you know, I don't want to nerd out too much on this stuff, but you know, there was, there was the latest fashions from Paris. And then you had that in the same seating you'd see, the the typical frontier stuff like the buckskin or the cotton linen type yeah, stuff. Yeah, that, that was you, really cool. Yeah, that you typically hear people wearing back then. Yeah, so 1835, 1836, that's when Texas was becoming a republic. Yeah, that's when we were becoming, yeah, that's when we were born. So. Yeah, first president of Texas, Sam Houston. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, and then the father of Texas was uh, with the college I was went to is named after Stephen F. Austin. Yeah. He was the one that brought people, he, he was called an impresario because yep. he brought people to Texas and said, this is going to be your place. Right. You know, this is going to be where you live. Yeah. So, um, you know, I always try to kind of mirror the guests with my theme. So I wore the Space Force I shirt. Love it. <laughs> and I wanted to bring up Space Force because when it, when, when Trump first announced it, a lot of people made fun of it. Uh, there, you know, there's lots of memes, you know, dealing with like Starship Troopers and a lot of people really didn't know what they were talking about or what the purpose of it was. And then you had people like me creating memes just for the heck of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, which, uh, if you haven't followed Brian on social media, you, you got to check out his meme game. I'm because... probably going to open up a meme page because it's just, it's <laughs> getting got too to. much. Yeah. yeah there, there, there's so many out there and originals too. Yeah. You know? Brian's meme warehouse and emporium is what i'm looking at yeah there you go <laughs> yeah um have you ever used a pickup line that said you're a, a create curator of memes for the u.s department of of memes that, <laughs> that is on the list actually yeah. i want to that's i need to make that like a meme historian or something and so, you, you yeah. need to say it with the straightest face possible oh, and, and i think you can do it i oh, think you can, can pull it off oh, yeah absolutely and just wait for the reaction absolutely and maybe continue it on uh, and, and if you use it as, a, as at a bar, you know, depending on how many drinks the other person's in, they may go they may actually with, fall for it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and have to follow up with it. But uh, but back to the space force, people thought that it was you know sending troops up to space, and yeah. that there was going to be intergalactic warfare, and that's not the case. Uh, what it was created for, or what it, it is intended to be created for, is focused on military influence of of space travel with with satellites. Uh, before the 1960s, there was zero satellites orbiting the Earth. There was nothing up there but the yep. moon. The moon was the only thing we had orbiting the Earth. It was completely clear. And I checked on this today. So right now, there's 4,987 total satellites orbiting the Earth right now. Uh, and in total over, over history, you know, because we decommission them from time to time, they, their orbits degrade and they burn up or, right. we, or we kinetic kill them. Uh, so in total... Since, uh, you know, the history of the space program, there's been 8,378 that have been launched up there. And another interesting fact is there's seven that are in orbit around other celestial bodies. You know, so we've got one going, we've got a lunar orbiter, a Mars orbiter. And we've got Voyager, well, both Voyagers. Yeah, and then we've got a, a Sun orbiter, and uh, Jupiter and Saturn had yep. some. So there's, there's seven that are on other celestial bodies, but almost 5,000 that are around the Earth right now. And we're so dependent on them for... Uh, Missile warning dis- d- uh, systems, global positioning systems, or GPS, you know, surveillance of space, and uh, missions involving satellite communications. So the Space Force is actually going to be guys in a room with computers that are monitoring things and making sure that our enemies aren't taking out our satellites so that we can't communicate with one another. If, yep. if, if, if we went to warfare and had no GPS, that would be... Uh, you know, huge. Oh yeah, victory for the the opposition. I mean, you know, we saw in Hurricane Rita some years ago. Uh, I was on active duty at the time, but 
that was back when cell phones were very dependent on towers that that really weren't advanced like they are now. Right. They didn't quite have the capacity to to store all that. And yeah, you, it was a lot. They the, all went down. You couldn't make calls. Yeah, the GSM phones before yes, we had the yes, four four yep, G LTE. Yep, yep, yeah, it was what. Yeah, my headset just went out. Oh, that's probably just the cord. You should be good. Oh, okay. Did jiggle it? Did it come back on? No, we got hacked. <laughs> it might be down there at the at the link. Yeah, there we but, go. Yeah, you're sorry still... guys, we got hacked. If you're listening, <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, those uh those auxiliary cables, you know. So uh, so I thought that was interesting with the space force because they're actually already there. You know, the air force has had a a, a manned space command where they have their own set of astronauts. Correct. They've just never gone up. Right. They're they're kind of ready and they train together hand in hand with NASA, and they have around thirty thousand you know people that are dedicated to that initiative. Right. The Space Force just simply makes them their own branch and they have their own budget and things like that. Right, absolutely. So do you think that's something that's needed or has the Air Force got this handled? I think, you know, again, making comment as a private citizen. um, Yeah. I think over time, something like that would absolutely be needed. Um, You know, I'm I'm, I'm not too knowledgeable on the Air Force Space Command setting and what they exactly do. But um, what I do know is that you're absolutely right. The future of warfare is we're already seeing it with the whole Iran situation. It's beyond borders. It's going to be beyond conventional warfare. It's, we're going to dip into information warfare and that's just the future. I mean, everything we do is, is like I said earlier, is based on an information device or an electronic device that transmits information. And so disabling your enemy from doing that, from using that stuff is absolutely going to put you at a, at a huge step above them. And we saw this in, as early as 2007, the Russians, we think the Russians, crashed um, um, the entire infrastructure in Estonia. And essentially, they couldn't bank. They couldn't pay their bills online. They couldn't get on the internet. They couldn't even pull stuff out of the machines yeah. like like ATMs. Anything that had a Ethernet cable plugged into it was done. It was crashed for like an entire week. Right. So, yeah, and one of the main problems with uh, the Lone Survivor Group was communications. Yeah, you know, absolutely. They, they, they couldn't get through to anybody to let them know what was going on or – get a you know an extraction point yep. things in, like that any uh, major crisis situation the one thing that will absolutely bring you down is communications right and so. even the weapons are usually dependent upon those systems that you know oh, with, absolutely. with their guidance and things like that absolutely uh, most of the planes are you know flying themselves these days so yeah uh, but it's all dependent on those satellite systems so i think the space force is designed to protect those systems and defend against uh, enemies from you know doing doing things like a connect kill that's where you have satellites that are orbiting, you know, at tens of thousands of miles per hour, and you send something at the exact trajectory in the opposite direction, and they collide, and right. it, it just obliterates it. Yeah. And, and that's actually how we have decommissioned satellites that need to be taken down. Sometimes we do a kinetic kill. Well, that yeah. can also be done for, you know, for an enemy it satellite. It's a mess up there. I was looking at one of those graphics the other day, and it's just amazing how many, how much junk, space junk there is. Yeah, there is. And... They cat, you know, they have to catalog it very carefully. That's how I got that number today because there's an actual agency that that tracks that number, and they wow. have to be down to the exact number. That's why it's four thousand nine hundred eighty-seven, not just a guesstimate. But uh, and and when you look at the graphic, it kind of show it shows how you know it looks very cluttered. You know, there's dots everywhere representing the satellites, uh, and of course it's not to scale because if you look at the Earth and you look at those dots, then some of the dots are the same size as like a small state. Right, absolutely. And some satellites are, they could be anywhere from the size of a loaf of bread to the size of this room, but they're still, you know, the size of a car, but they're much, much smaller than what they're depicted. So, you know, when you're on the ISS or when you're looking at a, a live feed from the International Space Station, you know, you don't see anything. You just see yeah, vastness I have that, of space. Yeah. So, uh, so it doesn't look quite like that graphic. The graphic's just kind of a representation of the the number of dots. Right, and yeah. Everything. And but. There's, and that's everything. That's the Gemini program pieces, the Apollo pieces, yeah, all the stages, all rocket stages. Stuff yeah. that flew off a of Skylab. You know, yeah. there, there was one that fell in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, Skylab before. fell in the ocean, I think. Yeah. I late think that, 70s. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And yeah, so the International Space Station is interesting because I always make the reference that the only place in the entire world or off the world that different countries can get along is space. Because there's a, about 11 different countries that work together on the International Space Station. And one of them is is Russia. Yep. Russia is our biggest partner in space exploration. Which is completely ironic. <laughs> it is. Because we ever since the, the space shuttle program was decommissioned, 
we had a program in place to take that on, which was the Constellation program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Obama administration killed that. And so we had to hitch a ride with the Russians on the Soyuz. Mm -hmm. And Russia has so many rockets. I mean, they just, they're old school rockets, but they just have so many of them that, that we pay them to transport humans from, that's our only way. Uh, so until SpaceX and when, and they're very close, you know, they're, they're doing unmanned missions right now mm -hmm. with the dragon to do resupply missions. And then they've got Falcon heavy. So they'll have human missions taking off from the U S very soon. And since Russia doesn't have a Navy, you know, with the shuttle program, we did water landings. Yes. Water landings have a much. Soil uses land. Yeah. It's oh, a land. And uh, so poor back. I couldn't imagine. Yeah. They have to, uh, it's, uh, it's over Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan yes. and, uh, then they fire the retro rockets and then it parachutes, you know, to the ground. But it's, uh, it's much more of a, uh, less margin of error than a, than a water landing. Russia just doesn't, doesn't have the Navy fleet to go get them. Yeah. You know, we, we would throw the boosters in the, in the ocean and retrieve them, uh, then do a splashdown. It's much, much easier. You know, if, if something goes wrong with the retro rockets, it's a splashdown instead of a crash. If you ever really get bored for, you know, anybody listening or, you know, you know, you, even you, Tyler, if you go on YouTube and you look up, uh, the GoPros attached to some of the booster rockets that went up with the shuttle. Oh yeah. It's really cool. They go all the way up and you see the shuttle, you know, separate, you know, with the, um, fuel tank. And then you mm -hmm. see these things falling all the way back to earth. And it's just really, it's just, to me, it's fascinating. Yeah. So. And what's even more fascinating is when SpaceX lands them on, on oh, a yeah. barge yeah. and and it looks like you're watching a takeoff, yeah. but in, in reverse, <laughs> you know, it really looks like science fiction landing. It's the future right. of space exploration. I'm yeah, excited sure. for it. Yeah. It's much more cost efficient. Uh, it's, it's easier to reuse. Uh, and you know, the, the shuttle program was really just designed to build the international space station with cargo because it, it, it wasn't able to, to reach out farther. So with, with, uh, with Falcon heavy, you know, they'll be able to, and the, and the SLS, the space launch system, they'll be able to, you know, reach out past and, you know, get us to Mars. Right. There's, you know, we have the technology now to, to get to Mars pretty quick, but we don't have a way to get back. And that, so right It'd now, a one it's a one-way mission, one-way yeah. trip. Uh, eventually it'll have to be, you know, very similar to the movie, The Martian, where they send equipment ahead of time mm -hmm. and just use AI to kind of, you know, put it in place and set it up and then send someone there. Because right. in order to get back, even though Mars has a, a thin atmosphere, it still has an atmosphere that you have to blast off from. And if you ever look at the rockets that are required to escape our atmosphere, some of them are just going to low Earth orbit. You know, it takes, when we went to the moon, it took the Saturn V, which uh, if you're in Beaumont, you know, Edison Plaza, mm -hmm. in the Intergy building. So if you stacked up, if you took the Intergy building, which is one of the tallest buildings in Beaumont, stack another one on top of it, the Saturn V would be a little bit taller than those two. Oh, that was an absolute beautiful machine that, yeah. that, that Werner von Braun invented. Yeah. And so once it escapes the Earth's atmosphere, it's used up all that fuel. Yep. Now they're in a little bitty command module. And then that goes to the moon because th there's zero gravity yep. now um, or microgravity. But it's, it takes so much combustion power just to get that far off the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And so you have to do the same thing coming back on another planet. Right. And so that's going to be the big challenge is getting people. Now, I don't think there's any shortage of people that would sign up for a one-way mission. But, I mean, it's, it, you, you just have, you, know, you, get, you communicate and you, you, it's got to be a, a bad situation. I, think, I don't think they're going to do that no, anytime soon. I, I, I just, you know, I think one of your last guests was saying that, you know, you know, space exploration in our lifetime, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes to. Yeah. Um, I think that we'll see a manned mission to Mars and that's about the coolest thing we're going to see. Yeah. And absolutely. we won't, we just simply won't be alive long enough. No. And, I mean, it was great seeing Voyager hitting interstellar space. That yeah. was phenomenal. Not long mm -hmm. ago. Um, you know, that, that was something I didn't think that that little thing would ever achieve. Right. So, and I, I haven't announced this yet, but I, what I'm going to do on the show, I'm going to try to find a legitimate flat earth, theory believer somewhere <laughs> somewhere locally and i'm going to debate them on on the podcast and i'll be nice yeah but uh i i need to find a really good one so i you know there's there's some that are inter international and i just found out that i think it's in november the 2019 international flat earth convention is oh going to be gosh. in texas is it really it's going to be in frisco texas well they, they certainly picked a good flat place for it <laughs> <laughs> But it's because I would really love to get one of those heavy hitters, you know, that has the millions of hits on YouTube. I'm, yeah, I just, I want to listen to them, you know. I I'm, I'm, I always like hearing all sides. Yeah, but, uh, uh, a lot of them just aren't ready to believe. Because if you ask one, you know, what would it take to convince you? And they'll say, 
you know, how it would it would take you know me going up there or something like that, and it, because they know that's not possible. Uh, like with if, if someone didn't believe that we could, you know, fly around the Earth or uh, take a ship around the Earth, you know, you could say, hey, you know, we can finance this. That that's doable. But I can't take you to space. I just can't, you know, uh, yeah. because if 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 there's if they're really wanting to to know. And you say, look, here's a photograph that was taken by a human of a full Earth on the way back from the moon. And they'll say, well, that's fake. And say, well, you're just not ready to, <laughs> to believe. There's nothing more that I can do for you. I, I just, you know, I, I've i heard people say, you know, stuff like we didn't land on the moon or we didn't really go to space. And to me, this was my argument as a somebody who studied the Cold War in both degrees, mm -hmm. my opinion is this, is ask the Russians. They'll be the first to tell you we didn't go because they spent an entire, you know, 60 years, a couple of decades trying to prove us wrong so, to, to make them look good. Right. KGB or the Soviet Union never came out with anything, you know, with anything and said, oh, yeah, they didn't really go to the moon. We got proof of it. No, they would be the first to They'd expose They'd be the first. Us. They would love the to The Eastern Bloc us. would love to have done that. And I always say that they actually won the space race because literally going to the moon is kind of all we did. So the Russians had the first— Way more stuff. Yeah, the first man-made satellite in orbit, which was Sputnik. Yep. They had the first animal in space. Like they had the first human to orbit the Earth. Um, they— you know, you, you Gary Gagarin. Yep. They did so many firsts that we were on the tail. And, you know, yeah, we made it to the moon and then went back. And then there was no way they were going to, you know, get there. Uh, so that that's a huge accomplishment. But uh, as far as kind of winning the space race, they were, they were ahead of us for a long, long time. Yeah, the Soviets absolutely really, really hit it hard. And, uh, you know, like you said, they, 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 I think they even had the first female in space, if I'm not mistaken, too. Yeah, it could be. Uh, but yeah, that's my dog's name, Sputnik. I, I had to name oh, okay. him after the satellite. <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, with uh, with space exploration, you know, uh, that's the timeline is the hard part. They're, we're just too far away from the things we want to visit. We're we're in the infant stages. I mean, there's going to be 200 years from now. We're going to say, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be a museum at the Apollo 11 landing site. You know, that's just what I think in a couple hundred years from now. Yeah, it could be so. Uh, and a lot of people think that, you know, why don't we set up a base on the moon? Why don't we want to live on Mars? So I went scuba diving a couple weeks ago. And being on the moon would be similar to scuba diving 24-7. Like, I'd, I'd scuba dive for about an hour, and I'm ready to get out. Yeah. You know, I'm confined. I'm breathing through a tube. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't really walk around normally. And, and that's... I don't only have like a minimal amount of gear on. And in space, it's even worse. I mean, you're completely encapsulized in a in a you know a 300 pound suit all the time. And if you're not doing that, then you're in a pod, you know, a pressurized pod. So you're on an airplane basically. And you know how you hate to be on an airplane for like more than a couple of hours. You know, I spent you're like 12 hours yesterday on one. <laughs> yeah, so you're you're ready to get out. You're you're indoors. Uh, think think about a rainy day here when you're constantly indoors and you think, man, I would really love to see the sun right now, feel some grass on my feet, have the sun hit my face. We're well, not going to do that. You're going to be constantly in a pod. So, I, unless we could, you know, terraform Mars, you know, melt the ice caps, have free flowing water, uh, the atmosphere would have to change a little bit. It's it's mostly CO2, a thin layer yep. of CO2, and we would, you know, we'd have to have nitrogen, oxygen, have some photosynthesis going on. I don't think you would want to live there. You would want to visit, and but you know not live there. And the, and the moon would be even worse. The moon has zero atmosphere. Oh yeah. So you're exposed to way all, less gravity. Yeah, all the solar radiation. Yep. You don't have any protection uh, as far as a, an ozone layer or a magnetosphere. And and you like you said you you would either be in a suit or a pod. You know, twenty four seven. So it, it's no different than living at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Really, yeah. or living in a submarine and maybe going out. From time to time, and if you look at, if you ever go to NASA and look at the command service module, the CSM or the lunar uh, excursion module, it oh, is, they are tiny. tiny. Yeah. It's tinier than the space we're talking in right now. It's it's yeah. little. There's some replicas that you can climb in, and yeah. and you know you have to sit almost inverted, and there there's three. Yeah, the size of this table uh, fits like three grown men. Yeah, you know, kind of side by side, and so yeah, it's just it's just not practical yet. It's not like you see on Star Wars or these movies where there's these 
aircraft carrier size ships just cruising along and then wait that's not real going <laughs> going into light speed <laughs> i thought nasa invented uh, thunderstorms to hide space wars walking around yeah <laughs> that's another one uh space is, the hashtag space is fake yeah yeah oh, gosh. well the whole the whole flat earth thing was like an accident you know it was it was like a joke on 4chan or reddit and all that and people started making those videos and then and then people just kind of went awry with it and started believing it and it, it was meant to be a it was like it was like a meme it was meant to be a joke and then these people started doing these experiments that that aren't correct and showing people you know they're taking levels on an airplane and uh pouring water on a plate saying why doesn't it fall yeah and oh my it just gosh. It, you know all the experiments uh there's there's one on netflix where they do all these experiments and the experiments keep failing for them for their motive and they don't understand why and they're like wait we just got to get different equipment and gosh I, I, yeah <laughs> I, I i just couldn't imagine thinking yeah. that i mean if you if you go out into the open ocean the, i mean the open sea you can almost see the curvature of the earth yeah you have to uh the the perspective is almost a little bit too uh close when you're on an airplane at thirty five thousand yes. feet and and even when you're on the international space station on their camera it's not you know they're almost not quite far enough you really i mean the earth is so big for where we are you have to really get that uh yeah longer perspective to see the curvature uh, especially on an airplane window your field of view just isn't wide enough no yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can go to galveston you know which is uh, the coast is 45 minutes away from us right here, and, and they've got telescopes, you know, that you can look at ships, and you can clearly see a ship, you know, go yeah, over, over the horizon, horizon yep. and disappear from bottom to top. And But, yeah, you would if you would be able to see Everest if you were looking yeah, straight ahead flat, and, yeah. and it were flat. And, you know, where where is the sun going and at nighttime? Where is the, the moon going? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they— Time zones would be difficult for a flat earther to explain. Yeah. Uh, the tallest building in the world, the the, I guess it's the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Yes, you know it. It almost uh, when when the sun is setting and you know is going beyond the horizon, the people at the uh, the top of the building are are getting the sunset a little bit later than the people on the ground because it's so high. That's actually really neat. I never knew that. Yeah, that's, and and because the really cool. the sun we're eight light minutes away from the sun, so the light that we're seeing from the sun takes eight minutes to get from the sun to to earth and so when the sun if you're watching a sunset and go the sun goes beyond the horizon that second that it goes down it went down eight minutes ago and you're watching it come to us uh similar to when you see the the stars and the galaxies yes uh if they're four light years away then you're seeing the light from that object four years ago right and so when you talk about hundreds of light years away and you see stars, it, there's a good chance that some of those stars have gone supernova or burned out. Yep. And you're seeing the leftover light for hundreds of years. And if you were able to travel fast enough to there, it would be gone. Yeah, and I've I've always found space history fascinating. Um, I actually have a Dobsonian telescope that I'll, I'll break out mm -hmm. every now and then on my land up in Louisiana. I always found the satellites orbiting the Earth, just the most fascinating things in the world. I don't know why, yeah. um, but it's it's just neat to see something that far away mm -hmm. and then turn the telescope and, like you said, see something that may have burned out hundreds of years ago, mm -hmm. but it's still there. It's Space is, it's um, it's not like cybersecurity. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's very objective in that it's, it's, the history behind it is so fascinating and the possibilities that are out there are just, it, it just boggles my mind to think that, you know, Earth is may not be alone. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think we could be alone. There's just no way. And I think we, you talked about that last time. Yeah, yeah, talking about the the elements that are out there that are scattered by supernovas and stars, yeah. explosions, or you know, there's five basic elements, and you know, we're carbon based life form, and there's a lot of carbon out there. Yeah, so, there's almost, tons. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, we were talking about SpaceX. Uh, their CEO Elon Musk. Yeah. I saw a picture of you had the the boring company flamethrower on the on my podcast page. The uh, the profile picture is me firing up a boring company flamethrower. So I, I've shot one. You've shot one. Yes, I meant to send that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll so, get it to you. So how did, how did you get a hold of one of those? Did you? I have a friend that owns an emergency response uh, business, and uh, and he just he, – he uses this for training. And I said, I would love to um, – I'd, I'd love to try that. Yeah, <laughs> and it was it was it was really the coolest thing I think I've ever held in my entire life because you know it's, oh for sure <laughs> yeah it, it was so clever that he named it not a flamethrower because there were certain countries where he couldn't mail a flamethrower through right. uh, through the postal service you know kind of like when you go to the post office and they say is there anything hazardous liquid flammable 
dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Well, apparently there's some countries out there where you're, you're not allowed to mail a flamethrower. So, and it's not a flamethrower anyways. It's a, a roofing torch yes. that has an airsoft <laughs> rifle a, cover over it. It's a very enhanced torch. Right, yeah. And and so you screw on the you know little propane bottle, kind of like when you go camping and mm-hmm. you have a Coleman yep. little uh, propane tank for, for You got to use it all. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he so the official name of it is not a flamethrower. And I only really know one person in Southeast Texas that has one is is Kyle Barnes. And uh and so he let me uh use that at the the wall mural over there on Calder so I could have a cool profile picture. Nice. Yeah. nice. And and when I saw yours I, I said there's another one out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it was, it was, it was great because, you know, um, when I was working in that job field, we were using it for training and, uh, it's, it's really good for mosquitoes too. I mean, in the summertime, you can just spray your backyard with it. You're good. <laughs> That's a good point. So, a dual purpose. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're going to San Diego next week. Uh, next month. Or, yeah. Oh, next month. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, um, have you ever been to San Diego before? Oh yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've been to San Diego quite a bit in my so military I went career. a couple of years ago and I did a tour of the USS Midway. Yes. Have you ever been on the I have, yep. Yeah. Yep. It was very fascinating that that carrier was the lead carrier for the Admiral in Desert Storm. Yep. And it wasn't nuclear. That was one of the older aircraft carriers. It was one I, of the last diesel powered, like yeah. true fuel powered ships. That but we really the had. the Admiral requested to be on the midway. Yeah. Instead in, instead of yeah. Desert Storm had a lot of interesting concepts with vintage equipment. We had the uh and and I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, it was uh, it was the USS Missouri actually. It was one of the old BB class from World War II that the Japanese had surrendered on, and we used it in Desert Storm. Oh wow! It's like I thought this is the coolest thing in the world. It was actually in Hawaii when I was stationed in Hawaii. It was there at Pearl Harbor. Yeah, as a museum ship. Yeah, the the, the Midway had some little models set up, and they had kind of one of the first aircraft carriers you made out of wood. Yeah, probably. The, I think that was a Langley. But yeah. yeah, and it was next to the Gerald Ford. Yep. which is the one of the biggest and the yep. longest, and it's nuclear powered, of yep. course. And man, it's just like a floating city. Yeah, I mean, so many personnel uh, could stay out there for months at a time yep. and never have to port. I wish. Uh, I wish our. Our space exploration technology went, went, you know, went as quick as that. You know, that'd, that'd be pretty nice. Yeah, so. it's it's definitely about the budget when it comes to space. Oh, yeah. There's there's just uh, no return, no. so uh, there's nothing out there for them to profit off of. Right. And there's nothing out there to to fight. So that's uh, there's, there's nobody <laughs> to chase anymore. So yeah, it's just uh, it's up to the the billionaires, yeah, you know, and the dreamers that just want to do it for fun. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, you know, send a Tesla Roadster. Up into space for no reason. That was cool. Yeah. Now they should have sent a Ford Larry at F one fifty, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> what I really like is all the the clever intricacies that they add to that. So, for example, it's 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 playing music on an endless loop. The yes. David the David Bowie song. Yep. And they named the guy Starman. He's got a copy of the book of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in the glove box. The dash says "Don't panic." There's all these little things that like weren't necessary at all yeah. <laughs> that i feel like i would have done you know just for no reason i have a feeling if aliens find that they're gonna just roll the window up and lock the door when they drive by earth <laughs> yeah yeah there's a good chance that they visit us and they determine that there was no We're, intelligent life they yeah. just kept on going <laughs> yeah. it, they probably saw some dating apps yeah they, 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 <laughs> and that's interesting too because everything that we transmit is out there is out there yeah and it, it takes light year you know radio signals that are electrical or travel at the speed of light so everything that we've sent since the, you know, the the dawn of of radio or television or antenna has been traveling out there, and yeah. somebody can receive it. Especially with the Voyager spacecraft, when we sent the gold records. I think one of my favorite analogies um, was was one of the space scientists, and I forgot his name. He was the one that made the gold record. Um, I, oh, Carl Sagan. Yeah, Carl Sagan yeah. did a brief in the late eighties. No, it was mid nineties mm-hmm. when Voyager had reached. Uh, a, a, a very long limit from Earth. I think it had been underway for almost 20 years by that yeah, point. Yeah, pale blue, pale blue dot. Yeah, it was it was the pale blue dot, and they yeah. thought it was a little speck of dust. And 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 mm-hmm. Carl Sagan put it quite well. He said, "This, you know, if you see that right there, that's us. Yeah. Everything you know and have lived for and fought for is right there on that little piece of dust." Yeah, you can't tell by the video, but uh, I just got chills just thinking about the pale Absolutely. blue dot because it's so powerful and the things that he said you, you know if you haven't ever if you've never heard him read the pale blue dot you should look it up on youtube and, and, and hear it at least once uh he he said something that really struck a nerve with me of uh imagine how embarrassed all the army generals would be if they knew they were fighting over something that's that small you know yep. fighting over a, a fraction of a piece of land yep. that's that's just 
Uh, Nothing. The tiny pinhead. Yeah. And that's something that the International Space Station astronauts talk about a lot is when they're flying up there, you know, they, they rotate the Earth every 90 minutes. Yep. So they're going completely around quite often. And there's no, they don't see borders. You know, they just see, uh, you know, Pangea broken apart. Yep. And, the, you know, they see the lights at night. And to them, it's kind of like everything is one. And you, you really get the sense of like, hey, we're all on the same team here. But down here, we realize that, hey, we're not. You know, there's legitimate people that want to hurt me, that want to hurt you. And unfortunately, they don't have all that same mindset. And, and even with us as a country, if we say, hey, we're cool with everybody, we want to be nice. They still want to hurt us, so yeah, we really got to keep our defenses up. Unfortunately, yeah, that's the that's that that's the sad reality. But you know, you're absolutely right. You know, when you look at it from that perspective, it, it just makes no sense. Yeah, so. yeah. I remember when when you're in history class in elementary, you always learn about uh, Switzerland and Sweden yeah. being neutral. That's like the the one thing that you yeah. learned about. Them. I'm I'm usually a Switzerland when it comes to anything. <laughs> yeah, but they have cool knives. They do, yeah. and they have good chocolate. If you've ever been to Switzerland, I highly no, I've never been to the Nordic countries, oh, it's brilliant. but it's I, I love Nordic culture. I have yeah. a lot of friends up there. Oh, okay. They're probably listening right now. Yeah. <laughs> and did you travel a lot in the Coast Guard or travel more now? That's a really good question. Um, somebody asked me that the other day, and I think uh, I think my current job working, um, you know, doing what I do now is taking me on the road just as much as um, in my military career. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's, it's split evenly between the two. And is the travel for public speaking mostly, or is a it lot for of consultation? It a lot of it is for, for, for public speaking, you know, getting out there saying, Hey, this is, this is what cyber is, you mm-hmm. know, for my civilian job, you know, this is what cyber is. This is what, you know, you should be concerned about. This is what the threats are. Um, and really my goal is to get this information out there to everybody, not just a certain audience, but People need to know, you know, we talked about at the beginning, what are the threats? You know, mm-hmm. people need to know that everything you do has a footprint and you just got to know how to cover that footprint up as best you can. Yeah. So, Well, back to your collectibles, have what is, what is something that you've come across that may be your most valuable item? That's a very good question. You know, some um, of it you're making yourself, <laughs> so it may be priceless, you know, it didn't really have Absolutely. a value. But is there a certain collectible item that you came across that maybe you had to pay a lot for or that may, I did. may have grown in value now? I think my most expensive and most rarest item that I have to keep in a in a box full of mothballs so moths can't get to it and you know cedar and all that is probably a British 1871 officer's frock and and what's a frock it's a very long coat that okay. they used to wear they still wear the same pattern but this one's 1871 original kind of like a duster almost yeah sort yeah. of kind of yeah it's got a high <laughs> choker tunic on it. They, they it was usually a parade dress but uh, oh okay but uh, this one is so intricate. The amount of work that went into this thing probably took months, just this one frock. Um, and on what I found on the inside was the entire inside is lined with cotton imported from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Dated 1871. You don't see that. I yeah. mean, it's in a British uniform. It's very, to, in my knowledge, very rare. But, um, yeah, that one's uh, – I, I came across that on eBay, <laughs> and uh, it fits me. <laughs> But I'm afraid to wear it because of just the rarity of it and yeah. uh, the amount of work that is into it. I mean, if you saw it, you'd be like, wow, this, 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 the, all the braids and everything. Have you collected any weapons? Uh, yes, I do collect a lot of antique weapons. Do you um, have any swords? I do have a couple of sabers. Wow. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have Dragoon sabers from the War of 1812. I have Civil War sabers from— So would the saber be different than a sword? Is that a different name? Yeah, or? so— um, a, a, a dragoon saber is 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 curved. It's it's meant for horseback. Oh yeah. And so it's got the uh yeah, so yeah, so you're able to actually hit on the run and then recover from it quickly. So uh, that's that's what it's meant for. Whereas a sword is kind of it's it's just straight, a straight yeah. stabby. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's that's how you know there's you know the 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 difference between is it a mounted cavalry weapon or a regular infantry weapon. Does it seem like some of those older uniforms aren't very functional? As far no, as like moving around. They are absolutely not functional at all. I, yeah. I don't understand, you know, my mother's family, you know, some of them are British and a lot of them served in some of the overseas colonial wars. And I collect some of the same uniforms that they would have worn. And I'm just thinking to myself, why would you wear this crap? <laughs> yeah. Because now, it makes no sense. You know, we have like the dress uh, uniforms. Yes. And, I, and of course, I'll probably use the wrong t- terminology because I'm not military, but. You know, when you graduate or you have a ceremony or you're getting a medal from the president, uh-huh. you know, you wear a separate uniform. Yes. And you don't wear that to fight in. 
No. But it seems like back then they wore those to fight in. Yeah. You know, and if you look, uh, somebody gave Zach a gift. It's uh, that's his dog. That's it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and they're wearing stuff like that. That's you know, it's got shoulder pads coming off the shoulder and all all these things. It looks like a, a circus ringmaster. It's horrible. It's yeah. I, you know, being a reenactor, I have done reenactments at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I've done all, all on the East Coast in the summertime. The yeah. same conditions that, that the Civil War soldiers would have fought in, wearing two layers of wool. And to me, I'm just like, yeah. stupid. Why are y'all I, doing this? Because they didn't have dry fit back then. No, they didn't. Yeah. And and you'll find, going back to, I know we're jumping around a lot, but going back to the That's 1830s, the nature of my podcast. I love it. This yeah. is great. <laughs> going back to the, the um, 1830s in Texas, you saw a lot of people wearing practical stuff like linen and cotton because they're like, I'm not wearing wool out here. And yeah. Southeast Texas in June. It's stupid. Yeah, it's cool now. You see a lot of the tactical guys are wearing you know, like basically Under Armour and Velcro yeah. and cargo pants and yeah, things absolutely. like that. Things with pockets, things that they can strap and put gear on and, yeah. and then also have, you know, sweat wicking dry fit. Yeah, I guess. absolutely. Yeah, and it's practical. And you'll find throughout history the people that defeated colonial forces like the British or even, you know, some of the insurgents in the Philippines in the early 1900s won because – they were more practically dressed in some situations. It's just they did stuff that made more sense. Guerrilla warfare, and I'm not going to go out there and put on a wool tunic in northern India and run around the heat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple of months ago, I was in the Dallas area, and I was in a, a neighborhood over in Midlothian, and uh, me and Jillian were riding bikes and, uh, you know, doing some exercise. And uh, she said, that's Chris Kyle's old house. And, you know, of course, uh, his widow moved. She doesn't live there anymore, but... He had a brick mailbox, and so when we were walking past it, I touched the brick mailbox because I thought maybe at some point Chris Kyle had touched the same spot. Yeah, and then, nice. You know, kept on walking. Nice. But it's awesome. But yeah, there was a big welcome home parade. You know, back when Jillian was living there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for him to come home and you know they shut down the streets and everything, and you know it's very sad what happened to him. Yeah, and, yeah, that was that was that was bad. Yeah, but that was pretty neat to you know walk on the same sidewalk and touch the same mailbox, and and, and that brings up a interesting point you bring up uh a, what somebody one time asked me why do you why do you reenact and and go to go to events and do this stuff why do you glorify war I'm like i don't glorify war at all i i don't i'm not a proponent of it um it, it's to me keeping the history alive of these people whether they're from the 1830s in texas or whether they're the australians in vietnam mm -hmm. I, I i believe as a veteran i believe in preserving those people's story that so that it doesn't die because history repeats itself if yeah. we let it die if you don't understand it if you don't get it if you don't keep that story alive if you don't dress up like this and go to the public and say hey this is what they wore this is what they did this is how they lived they don't have an appreciation for it yeah i really like the reenactments where they talk to a crowd and they're in character mm -hmm. have you ever done those where you're i have yeah at, the, at you know at the alamo in san antonio yeah, san jacinto yeah. goliad Gonzalez, Texas. That was the last time I saw it. Was when I was at the Alamo. And, I was probably there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there, there's a guy that's in a in a tent, and he would and he had all of his like cooking supplies yes. and weapons, and and he, you know, he gave himself a name that was probably like a you know an yep. 1800s name, and told us about his typical day as a as a Texas yeah. soldier, you know, in the Texas Army. And, and if really you cool. see, and if you see kids that look at this, and and that's how I fell in love with it was I went to these reenactments as a kid, and I saw it, and I said wow, this is cool. I want to do this. Not because it's cool, but it's because I get to live history. Mm -hmm. I don't just read about it. I actually get to live it. And to me, that's the cool thing. Yeah. So, Do you have anything from the Vietnam era? I do. Um, I do have um, original weapons for both the U.S. and the Australian forces. Um, a lot of people say, why Australian? Uh, they, they, I know some Australian veterans that served in Vietnam. And when they see this young American kid keeping their story alive, they're like, Oh my gosh! Wow! Like this guy actually appreciates what we did. Yeah, because when you, when you talk about war stories, you almost never hear about Australia. Oh no, they've been our allies since day one. Yeah, and you just never hear any stories no, coming not. coming from there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Vietnam era is really fascinating because that that group of veterans is still alive, and they're they're some of the you know mm -hmm. most messed up, you know, yeah. uh, and, and they, underserved maybe. And they all thank us when we go out and do a Vietnam setup. They they come out and they say, "I, I didn't think people cared." Yeah. That, they're keeping our story alive because it's i guess you know we people say that they lost people yeah. say that it was a, a war for nothing you know we right. had nothing to gain and then they're kind of like the, the forgotten about heroes right absolutely you know? uh you see when there's it's very rare these days to find a world war ii veteran yeah but they get treated like the president you know when they, they do, yeah. at a ballpark or throwing out a first pitch or something like that and then 
you know, you've got all the the Afghan war veterans and, you know, people that were involved with killing Osama bin Laden have turned into celebrities and yeah. book bestsellers and multimillionaires, you know, now. Uh, but people from, there's just nothing for the people from, and, from and, Vietnam. And sadly, Korea too. I mean, yeah, the Korean War. They're, been, they're still, they're about in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, maybe. about the 80s time range yeah, now. 85. So they're starting to thin out too. But, you know, I've done World War II reenactments where we'll have, you know, I had a former German soldier walk up to us and said, this is phenomenal. I was portraying British. But yeah, uh, even when I was portraying American, he's just like, this is amazing. You are keeping my story alive. Yeah. Do you have a particular nation that's your favorite to reenact? I love, I, I don't I don't know why, but uh, I've, I've always loved just the British and the Commonwealth because yeah. they have, you know, all my mother's ancestors from my grandmother's side were, were all very prominent throughout the British uh, history timeline. And, and I fell in love with that as a kid. And they have such an amazing story to tell. Mm -hmm. You know, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the British. That's really, in my opinion, um, it's very underappreciated. And so you you definitely have a wide variety of what I would call the uniform military. Yeah. What about even beyond that, like going back into the Greek and the, the Spartan? Man, I haven't done that, but... I, uh, I think that'd be interesting. I mean, there's not a lot of reenactments, but that's uh, a time period where there was just as much war as yeah. there is now. I don't I think, think there's any Roman veterans still alive. No, <laughs> there's not. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually the last Spartan alive. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very sad because after me, there's there's no. I did the 23 and me. It said 100% Spartan. Oh, nice, I, nice. I did yeah. that too. It was interesting. Yeah, it was the, really. Did, cool. did you do it for real? I did. Yeah, I did. I, I actually, I'm that, I'm not actually Spartan. I was from. It was mainly because of my dad, just Central Asia, and then my mom. You had Great Britain, Germany. That was it. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Did you have 1% African American? Everybody because, does. Yeah, yeah. I because think everybody does. The world started over there. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess that we all have it. That's know? a yeah yeah. That's, I don't know if 23 and Me is maybe like copy and paste in. Or, but, uh, <laughs> wow, Tyler, you look just like yeah. me. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't done a legitimate 23 and Me yet because I think in the fine print it says they keep a, a, a database that if the government needs it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because I don't want them to find out about my money laundering and things like that. Oh, I, I'm just kidding, uh, yeah. oh, we should probably go off the air. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this, this podcast makes a ton of money. <laughs> just kidding if you want to sponsor. <laughs> But yeah, I, I want to do it at some point because I want to. I, I mean, I pretty much already know what it's going to say. Uh, Troutman's a German name. It used to be spelled different, and, and it got Americanized. Yeah, uh, they spelt it the German way in Rambo. If you remember Colonel Troutman, I do. Yeah, Colonel Troutman. He spelled it T R A, -A, -A yeah. U T M A, and it has, I think it used to have two N's because that was more yeah. of a, a German thing. And a lot of people or a lot of immigrants from Germany changed their name to Americanize it because they wanted to look more. Or they wanted their name to look more American. Right. Uh, same thing that Trump's dad did. You know, it used to be D-R-U-M-P-H right. or something like that. Right. You know, something very German sounding and changing. Yeah. It's, uh, reenacting's good. It's, it's, uh, doing living history to the public is, it's, it, it just keeps history alive. And that's the importance of it. That's why we do it, you know. So. Are there any collectibles that are like elusive that you're trying to really get your hands on or they're just too far out there? You I would love. The Infinity Gauntlet? Close. Yeah. I want... <laughs> I want an Apollo astronaut suit. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're definitely not getting your hands on that. <laughs> no, probably never. There was yeah. one in the Houston airport yesterday. I'm like, I wonder if I offered him something um, to get it. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost – so I was in Nacogdoches in college whenever the space shuttle uh, had debris. And, and we all circled around this debris, and the National Guard was there, and we just stared at it. Uh, yeah, but that was sad. There, yeah, there, it, it wasn't really something that you wanted to take because, it, you know, it had – uh, right. negative implications associated yeah. with it. But, uh, it, it, you know, it was impactful to see something from space came down and, you know, was exploded and it landed in your backyard. Yeah, and I don't think we, you know, we had Apollo 1, we had Challenger. You and I are too young to remember that. But, yeah, unfortunately, Columbia was the space disaster of our timeline. Right. And and I think for for me, seeing that as a as a space buff, it really tore me up just to see that. The now, there's a lot of cool memorabilia from Saddam Hussein's, uh, what is it, palace? Yes. Or it might have been his son's yeah. palace. And so you remember some of the mercenaries like Blackwater yeah. and Triple Canopy? or yeah. what, there's, there's some of those, you know, paid mercenaries. Um, I knew a guy from that that has a doorknob from, it wasn't Saddam Hussein's palace, but it was one of his sons. And... They were like 
swimming in his pools. And, yeah, that was yeah, that was and, common after the war. Like yeah. during, like during the war, it was really common. And to looting see that. the palace, yeah. and it, and it's like a twenty four karat gold doorknob. Wow, that he just kind of shoved in his back. Wow, he didn't get it at Lowe's, did he? No, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find a replacement for one of mine. I may have to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a twenty four karat? No, no, I don't. I wish no. I did. No. Yeah. No. You, know, you can wrap, you know, have they they wrap the cars nowadays with the with the vinyl wrap. Oh yeah. There's a guy in Houston, it's a Clutch City Customs, and he gold wrapped a toilet. Wow. So it's just and it looks just like a gold toilet. That is cool. Um he also gold wrapped his Glock. Does anybody out there have one of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clutch City Customs on uh, uh Houston. But yeah, Gosh. he'll he'll wrap things for fun. He he mainly wraps cars. You know, he does wrap jobs on cars with right. the, the vinyl. And uh, but just for fun, he'll wrap odd things like a toilet or a, a gun. Or wow, yeah. good for him. Yeah. If you so, if you want a gold AK forty seven with or uh, what would you get? I would get the say hello to my little friend, which is do you, do you know what that Absolutely. one? Absolutely, it was an M sixteen with a grenade launcher. Because yeah. remember he was he was yeah two or three yeah 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 because he was he was shooting grenades a couple times and right then he, and then he had like an infinite magazine right and yeah, um, which is important because you have to refer to. Magazines as magazines and clips as clips because clips are, <laughs> and you oh, can go on a tangent for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you you don't say like I emptied the clip. <laughs> I know it drives me absolutely crazy when I hear that. Yeah, the clip holds the ammunition outside of the gun. And yes. the magazine holds the ammunition inside the gun. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that. Yeah. If I hear people say that, I I will walk away. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, there was a a very cool. A propaganda poster about gun control and it had a rifle with a shell leaving the barrel and it it wasn't just the just the lead it was the full like the primer what like what would normally get ejected was coming out of the barrel with like smoke coming nice. behind it nice. and and so uh you could tell that the the activists that put it together didn't know anything about firearms nice yeah. nice <laughs> gosh um, but yeah, when I was in Florida last week at Miami, there was a place uh, where you could rent machine guns, and you can you, you basically pay for a package. It's like a menu, and you you walk in there and you pick three different machine guns, fully automatic. And you so have, which one did you get? Um, so I I did the Chris Vector. Okay. And I think, it, yeah, that's like I a that and, I, and the reason I picked the Chris Vector is because it's so weird looking. It looks yeah, like yeah, it looks yeah. like a space gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. Uh, and then I gave Jillian the saw, which is the yeah, two forty nine, the, the massive one. Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, "Hey, you should pick the biggest gun here." They also had a Barrett fifty caliber. Yes, and those things are nice. They they have a, a photo, you know, kind of like a backdrop. And I wanted to take a picture of me with the Barrett, like in the prone position with the little bipod. And I was like, "Wait a minute, I don't think I'm in the right position, and somebody's going to roast me on the internet." So I don't, I didn't take a picture with it. So <laughs> I just kind of, I kind of held the Chris Vector with the, you know, I did the, yeah. the nice. trigger control. Nice. Yeah. Nice. But, uh, I, I shot the 240 Bravo quite a bit in my career. So oh, wow. That was a nice gun. Yeah. Uh, I guess, does the Coast Guard work hand-in-hand hand with the Navy? Oh, all the time. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So Breitling makes a watch. You know, Breitling's mm-hmm. kind of like a, a high-end watch maker, and they, they kind of specialize in the, I guess, maritime look. Yeah. And they have this Coast Guard watch. Do they really? It's like a $20,000 watch, and it's, it's massive. It's Coast Guard. Yeah, and you pull, wow. you pull the pin out. And it signals the Coast Guard to pick you up, like that if you're in distress. Awesome. And so I was curious if you ever got. I, this is what I heard. I heard if you pull it, it's expensive. Like I don't know. I, I don't think the Coast Guard like sends you a bill or whatever. But I know it's a big deal if you pull that pin. <laughs> is it in Marset powered? Uh, I guess so. Was, you know, with a with a battery and a satellite. Yeah. Uh, because it, you, they have one at uh, the Golden Nugget has a Breitling store uh-huh. or a watch store with several brands. But they won't let they'll so I walked in there and I was like, hey, I want to try on some Breitlings. They're like, yeah, you can try on this one, this one. And I said, Do y'all have the Coast Guard watch? And they're like, Yeah, it's in that case right there. I was like, I want to try on the Coast Guard one. They're like, no, nope. you can't try it on. <laughs> and uh they're like, We can we can take it out if a manager is here, but you can't put it on because it's such a big deal if you pull that wow. pin. Because it's not like you can call nine one one and say, Hey, the false alarm, I didn't make that call. Like it's serious. Like they're on on their way. Wow. But because I guess there's boat like I was on the scuba diving boat, and they say we have a beacon or whatever that if we need the coast guard, the coast guard will come get us if there's right. a problem. And so it's like the same thing in that watch. Yeah, that's that's probably all tying back into. And I don't know a whole lot about this stuff, but you know the, all the search and rescue stuff. But um, yeah, I, I think that all ties into into your your 
satellite system that they have for search and rescue. It's it's got to be satellite because yeah, how else would a watch find you? But right. uh, I guess for twenty grand, you can develop some technology to, yeah. to get it. Um, I know a guy in Lumberton that has one because he was sitting next to me at a football game, and and it, it's 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 really big. I mean, it, it's too gaudy to wear as a dress watch. It a lot of the people that have it probably wear it to show off. Um, you know, what are the chances you're going to need? The Coast Guard when you live in Lumberton, and, and you're and you're wearing it. So uh, I think the Nature's but, River goes up there. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you can just call me. I'll get you on the kayak. <laughs> yeah. It's Nature's River. Y'all yeah. come on. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little fast to go upstream, but I'll I'll be all right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was talking to him about it and then I did, and, and I, I, at first I was, I was like, this sounds like BS, but I researched it. It turns out it's a legitimate. It's Breitling it, that does Breitling. that? Breitling. Wow. Yeah. That's so really that, cool. that should be a retirement gift for you. you I know? am all about that. Yeah. You would definitely love to tell that story. Yeah. Of, of, you know, of cause, when I pulled it. <laughs> uh, I, I think also there's, there's a jewelry store. Oh, I'm going to, uh, I'll remember the name in a minute, but the owner has one. And he said he doesn't wear it when he goes out because he'll get drunk and want to. Yeah. Pull it. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I'll have to uh, remember who it was. So, so yeah, they're, they're out there. Yeah. yeah. And I definitely want, I want to get a dive watch one day because it, uh, the watches that say they're waterproof, like the little digital ones, uh, they're not really that waterproof when you get no, under, you can under like pressure. Down, yeah. When you go down a certain depth, they, they start. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's it. I went down about 40, 50 feet, and I, I kind of had my mask a little tight to begin with because I didn't want it to leak. And once you get down there, it kind of like doubles the pressure. Like my mask was just like squeezing the heck out I've of my I've never face. like scuba dived. I would yeah. love to. That looks really it, – it, it looks nice to just be able to go down without a snorkel. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, when you take your first breaths underwater, it's, it's very uh, – uh, I mean, you're, it's, you, I can't describe it. Uh, when you're breathing underwater. You feel like you're drowning. Yeah, or you feel like you should be yeah. drowning, but and you're not. It, and it's so peaceful. Well, that, I think to and me, very relaxing. Like I've tr- I've tried, you know, getting on a hose in some short excursion in Cancun that I did mm-hmm. on a cruise one time. Yeah, and and it, it, I think what freaked me out was looking around me, and I saw this lot in the South Pacific when I was down there for for mm-hmm. you know for my uh, Coast Guard career, you know, going snorkeling. But going down and looking around, there's dark blue just all around you. Yeah, it just. I don't know. That just scares me. Well, I, I got <laughs> and I'm certi- at the Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah, I got certified here, so I got certified in Smith Lake, where the visibility yeah. is like from me to you. Oh my gosh! And that and would I, freak me out. Yeah, so I was going down there doing the drills. Uh, the first time I did kind of freak out. I was like, I can't do it. And, he, and, and you know, the instructor kind of calmed me down, and then I was fine. But definitely going down off the coast of Miami, you know, it's super clear. Your visibility is like 100 feet out. And I got to go to Neptune's Reef, where people are getting cremated. And they're getting their ashes mixed into concrete. In, in, in Florida? Yeah. Okay. And they become like a starfish or a turtle wow. or different little molds. And they, they're, putting, they're putting those down there about uh, 40 feet down with other structures. It looks like Atlantis. That's really cool. And so it's a memorial. And it's becoming a reef. So other sea life and coral are attaching to those, uh, those cremated creations. Wow. And there's a little plaque, you know, the person's name, kind of like a headstone. Yeah. And and that it's a dive site because that's how you pay respect or visit them or see it. They like they want people to go there. That's right. Right cool. now it takes up about one acre and it's going to eventually take uh sixteen acres. And it's in conjunction with artists and you know, I guess a crematorium yeah, at yeah. some point. Um, you know, it's not something that I would want to do. I don't want to be down there, but uh I, I enjoy looking at it and I appreciate that they, you know, they want people to visit it. You know, and you just have to be, but uh, it's it's so peaceful because you feel like you're flying. You're weightless. Mm-hmm. You you have weights in your your BC, and then you also have a hose going from your your breathing tank into your vest. So you find that balance point to where you're just completely weightless, right? And I mean, you're just flying. So it's it's almost wow. effortless. You know, when you don't have any gear on, you're swimming. You know, you're doing a lot of work. You can only tread water for a couple minutes before you get tired. But uh, Scuba is really fun. I mean, you're, it, it's the closest thing to being in space. So, of feeling weightless. going to weightlessness, would you want to do the vomit comet? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how, and it, that's very. You can do it. It's very expensive, by the oh, way. Oh, for civilians, you can. Civilians can do it because wow. uh, the space gal uh, did it. Uh, Emily Calandrelli. Okay, she's a, a science communicator and uh, an engineer. She's on the show of. Uh, Bill Nye Saves the World? Yes. Bill, okay. Bill Nye, so Bill Nye, who of course, was like our childhood yeah. educator, has a new show. Um, he's gotten, over the years, he's gotten more liberal. You know, yeah. you have to, you know, he's still a, still a fan though. And so Emily Calandrelli kind of has a unique niche on Instagram because she's a very knowledgeable uh, 
astrophysics expert and engineer, but she's young and smoking hot. Right. So you don't really find right. that combination. And so that instantly makes you Instagram popular. So she's got, you know, millions of followers and uh, she's she's very nice and, and very well spoken. And she got to do the the plane. So it, it, it basically takes a dive mm-hmm. so fast that you're falling so fast you become weightless. And and it and it does that over and over and over. And it seems Man. like those people are having fun and they're not nauseous, you know, because they're they're in that balance of being weightless and and just kind of flying around that plane. I just think yeah. diving in a plane, I don't know, to me just doesn't sound like a a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> because just turbulence on a commercial flight, I don't like it. Yeah. But if I could feel like I was in space for 60 seconds, I well, would Well, there's some flights where I've briefly for maybe half a second felt, you know, you you, oh, yeah. you, you kind of feel it, you know, when you're descending. So. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever gotten to be on a uh I guess a lot of some of the Coast Guard helicopters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I've been on a lot of those, uh, some of the bigger aircraft, too, the C-130s. Did you have to do a lot of swimming to get into the yes. Coast Guard? Yeah, swimming. The Coast Guard Coast Guard boot camp is very centric around swimming and okay. mental stress. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll find it to be very stressful. Um, we're the second hardest behind the Marine Corps yeah. as far as boot camp toughness goes. Um, and then I guess BUDS, where they try to drown you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know anything about that, but yeah, yeah that's, that just doesn't seem like a good time for me. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I know about that is just from the stories of David Goggins. Yeah, I'll right? just sit in my air-conditioned office all day. and you know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, David Goggins, is, uh, as, as far as he knows, he's the only one to go through three hell weeks. In, right, in yes, the Navy that's Seals. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I, th- I think, are, are there only African-American or something like that, yeah. that that went through three hell weeks? Because Navy SEALs isn't very popular for African Americans because a lot of them are negative buoyant. Right. I guess with their bone density, their bone density is right. different, and they're not able. To, so, so the drown proofing is very hard for them, where they, uh, you're you're bound at the ankles and bound at the hands behind your back. Right. And you have to take a breath, sink sink down, yeah. and then jump back up to take another breath, and you're just doing that for an extended period of time longer than I would want to do it. I, I yeah, wouldn't want to do it I, once. I have the utmost respect for those guys that can do that because I, yeah. I, I mean, I love swimming, but I'm not quite that good. Yeah. And <laughs> the mean, coolest I, thing about Navy SEALs is they, they have to go through so many mental toughness exercises that make them mentally tough, physically tough, but a lot, there's, there's some of them that are also geniuses. Yeah. You know, you've got the guys that kick the door down and they're the sniper, but then you also have the demolition experts. Right. And the guys that can disable a, a power plant to cut this, cut the electricity to a building. Yeah. And they're, yeah, they're just, they're just phenomenal. And, and some of those black ops and spec ops, they have like their own separate budget and, you know, their own s- rules. You know, you would have the, the Navy SEALs that could grow, grow the beard over yeah. there and, you know, do, you know, kind of cowboy a little bit, uh, whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> does the, does the Coast Guard have a version of that? We, uh, no, we, 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 we don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have our rescue swimmers, which jump out of the helicopters and, and those guys are very, right. very robust as far as their training goes. And that was the movie with, I think it was Kevin Costner and Ashton, Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. That was about, yeah. uh, 15 years ago, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah the, yeah. the Coast Guard doesn't get probably the Hollywood. I know some people in that movie. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back, back then there were extras kind of sitting in the background. So. I think a really cool job would be to have your background but be a Hollywood consultant and say, you know, no, you can't film it like this. You have to yeah, film, you it, film like, it like that. Oh, yeah, that'd be yeah. fun. Or even uh, now my uncle did this with, and, and you'll think this is cool. So um, my, on my mom's side, my uncle's interesting with the reenactments too, but his go further back with uh, the Indians. So he, oh, wow. he would have Indian powwows on his land in Elkhart, Texas. Wow. And, and they would set up the teepee. He has a blacksmith shop. He has a um, a black powder cannon and black powder weapons. That's awesome. And they would have an Indian rendezvous and reenact a fight with Western cowboys and things like that. Right. So he got to go onto the movie set of the last last of the Mohicans, and he was kind of like an authenticator. He said, you know, you have to use these type of skins. Um, you know, the Indians are going to act like this. Yeah. And and kind of tell them what to do as far as uh, being authentic. And they said, hey, while you're here, do you want to be an extra? So he got to be in the Last of the Mohicans. Um, wow. I think there was a lot of red coats, and he's yes. just like one of one of them running. And then and then he was also an Indian, just kind of because those movies tend to have like big uh, crowd scenes, you know, and they need lots of people. Just Reenactors are the worst people to watch history movies with <laughs> oh, <laughs> because yeah. we will tear it apart. You know, mm-hmm. I I tend to hang around the authentic hardcore reenactors like that. Yeah, like 
when I watch a historical movie, like with my parents, they won't watch it with me because they're like, Brian, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you know, we're trying to watch. Yeah. Like, That's wrong. That's not the right button for that uniform. And, and I actually tore apart Dunkirk when it came out. Oh, yeah. I need so, to see that one. It's really good, yeah. though. It's very good. Um, I do the same thing with space movies because yes, if, you'll, if, if you'll notice in space movies, there are certain movies that NASA will associate themselves with mm -hmm. and some movies that they won't. Right. And the reason for that is they'll only associate themselves with uh, – positive yeah not movies. like destructive yeah for example the the one with uh um it was, it was called life where i haven't seen that one yet was it so, george clooney i think uh that was gravity yeah okay life is ryan reynolds i saw it yeah, yeah and yeah. they're on a space station it's not the iss because they couldn't use the branding but right. they're on the iss they find like a an amoebic life form and the life form kind of grows and then eventually attacks them mm -hmm. and it's more of a, a space horror movie so NASA has a, a job, which is the coolest job ever, by the way, that's the Hollywood liaison, and they coordinate— We should apply for that, both you and I. Yeah, I think the, the, the job that has probably—they're inundated with resumes, and they their job is to coordinate with the movies and see if this is a movie they're going to work with, and then they kind of take it from there. But since that movie is like a destructive movie, because everybody died in the end, yeah, and— Oh, sorry if you haven't seen it. <laughs> spoiler, sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, spoiler alert after the fact. Uh, so they don't want to be associated with that. For example, with Martian, they brought him home. It was a happy ending. And so they, that's a movie that they want to be associated with. Right. They feel like it'll recruit people to the astronaut program. Right. So they won't be associated. But here's the craziest part. NASA is associated with Transformers in a Michael Bay movie in Armageddon, which is the, the most fiction ever. I never they, understood that. They sl they did a slingshot maneuver with the space shuttle around the moon, knowing that the space shuttle has never gone any further than the ISS. The orbiter which, went which all is the like, way to the moon in yeah, the movie. I haven't it, seen it. So there, well, there, there's two space shuttles in in Armageddon. And how did it get and, to the moon? Is my first question. And then, and then they they land on a moving oh. asteroid. So I was really disappointed. This with, gives me an aneurysm you know, thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean they should have just used some different technology other than the space shuttle because the space shuttle would be the last thing that would have, that would have that capability. So it's interesting to see. You know, my point is the movies that NASA says yes to and then the movies that NASA says no to. You know, it's like, they, they, but they really like Michael Bay for some reason. I guess so. Is is he, the orbiter capable of leaving Earth's orbit? The orbiter? Space shuttle. Uh, oh, the 90s, 1990s space shuttle? Yeah. It can just go to the ISS and that's it. Okay. I mean, but. but it can't go further. Yeah. Oh, uh, it, it returns as a glider. It's completely yeah. out of fuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. When it gets to the ISS and that's it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's uh, it's a little too big for it, it. You know, it's got that huge cargo bay. Yes. To transport modules of ISS, and it's got that uh, arm. Can the, the Canada can arm. Canada arm. Yeah. Yeah. Why do they call it the Canada arm? I think because it was made in Canada. Mm. Could have called it the Beaumont arm. Had a big text joystick on there. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Jason's Deli. Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you a bit of a foodie or no? I love food. You know, when I travel. The first thing I do. That's the cool thing about traveling is you get yes. to experience. And, and I noticed you were a uh, Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I am a I, huge Anthony Bourdain fan. Yeah. I'm massive. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, I've watched him from day one. I was just sad last year when, you know, when I, when yeah, whenever I saw that I news. Know. But, um, you know, I've traveled all over the globe from Europe to Tahiti to, you know, Asia and, you know, some of the little islands in the South Pacific. The first thing I do, I find out where the franchise restaurants are and I avoid them like the plague. And yeah. I will go for the local stuff that only locals eat. Right. Like food trucks on the street, you yeah, know, and, for sure. you know, like the good stuff. Like That's that. my big thing is I don't want to go somewhere that we have at home when Absolutely. I'm traveling, but I, you can get it back. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can always find it here. And the one thing I always travel with is a bottle of Textroy. <laughs> I will <laughs> always have steak seasoning with me. Yeah. You've got to take it with you because it, it, it's interesting to see what, I, every time I travel somewhere that's, that's pretty far off, I always ask people if they ever eat crawfish and people are so weirded out, you yeah. know, and they want to really? know. What's they, crawfish? Yeah. And how, how you eat it and why you eat it and, and yeah. And it's just really cool to have that knowledge that, because, you know, you go somewhere else, you go to Napa Valley, everybody's a wine expert. Yeah. Uh, you go certain places and it's, it's, I guess it's cool to consider ourselves the crawfish and expert. Boudin, yeah. And Boudin. Yeah. Boudin. Yeah. Because there's a couple of people. People really more. don't understand Boudin. No, they don't. Right? And they're like, what's Boudin? I'm like, well. There's, there's people <laughs> in Texas, in Dallas that don't understand yeah. Boudin. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very regional thing. I didn't know that. I mean, when I was stationed in Hawaii. I would bring an empty suitcase with me, and I'd stack it full of boudin and bring it back. I'd, I'd freeze it. By the time I got on the flight, when by the time I got home, it was starting to thaw out. Throw it back in the freezer. Yeah, because in Beaumont, uh, when it comes to food, we're basically Louisiana. I think. Yeah, and it's not bad. I mean, you know, Beaumont in general is not bad, in my opinion. But uh, uh, 
yeah, the food here, you know, it isn't bad compared to everywhere else. Do you think you'll be in Beaumont uh, long term? You know, people ask me that. <clears throat> I love Beaumont. I, I really do. You know, when I left active duty, I could have gone anywhere in the country. Oh, and wow. I chose Beaumont, Texas. <laughs> I mean, it's, to me, it's. Where were you in, on active duty at? Uh, I was stationed in Hawaii and San Antonio. Okay. Uh, and some other places here and there. Yeah. Um, but. Um, was it Coast Guard in San Antonio? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was, what, it was, what's the thoughts on that? Or it, what's it was a big joint command, so. Oh, okay. We were guarding the river walk. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was it was a purple suit job. That's what we call it. It was it was oh, all okay. five branches that were there, and, and there, you know. right? Because there's a lot of Air Force in San Antonio. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Everybody's there in San Antonio. Yeah. Are they are they supposed to be wearing their Air Force uniform when they're on the Riverwalk? Is that a thing? Oh, or? so so a lot of people ask me about that. What's up with Air Force kids on the Riverwalk? That's where Air Force boot camp is in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. So I think for us it was week six or seven you get off base liberty which means you can go off base mm. you can you know your family can come see you and then they'll stay with you and then they'll come because they're doing all the liberty when i see them yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're all over the place in their uniforms so they're yeah. they're about to graduate basic training oh okay but yeah Beaumont, so they're probably celebrating a little bit yeah, yeah they're just trying to get out but uh Beaumont's not a bad place the people here are friendly everybody knows each other it's it's a small yeah. community but it's not too small it's big enough there's no way that I could have as much positive feedback on this podcast in a city like a bigger city like Houston. Yeah, or Atlanta or New York. Yeah. yeah. I have, you know, just enough friends to kind of build yeah. the momentum and they share it and also to get some of the high profile guests. Yeah. And I think that's what is great about your show. You have locals and mm-hmm. that's what people, the younger crowd that's trying to get life into Beaumont and keep Beaumont from being boring because it's really not. If you're bored in Beaumont any night of the week, there's something wrong with you because there's always something going on. You just got to know where it's at. Yeah, there's – if you just look at only Facebook events, which is just a a fraction, you would fill up your calendar to where you would have schedule conflicts. I have stuff every night that I do. I mean, there's nights where I'm like, I got to take a break. (laughs) Yeah, and then if you go and get uh, a newspaper or a VIP magazine or an events book, then you have a We're complete yeah you have yeah. a complete calendar yeah. of all the events going on, and you can easily fill it up. Even if you're just doing regular old like chamber of commerce networking events, which are, yeah. are fun, you could completely fill your calendar with those. Absolutely, and I always encourage people like our age to get involved with the YPO. I like I like to give a shout out to those guys around because they do a phenomenal job. You know, the Young yeah. Professionals Organization. We do great at bringing everybody together in this area. Yeah, for sure. Now, this will come out after the 4th of July, but uh, I want everybody to remember that downtown Beaumont has a phenomenal 4th of July celebration. They do. Everybody should go to it. Yeah, and they line the street with food trucks, you know, what little food trucks we have, but they're, you know, they're really good ones. And everybody gets lawn chairs on the, uh, the event center lawn and uh, the, the water features that we have out there. And they put on a really good show. Um, It used to be at Riverfront Park, before it got damaged right. in, in the storm. And that was really cool because people would get their uh, boats. They would put in at yeah. the saltwater barrier and the Beaumont Yacht Club and Country Club. And they would uh, park their boats out on the Nature's River right. and watch the fireworks show. But now it's just same same spot. You know, you just go to the event center. Yeah, and now, you know, the Julie Rogers Theater has the live orchestra. And it's it, it's 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 honestly the most American thing I think I've ever been to. It, yeah, it's so it, fun. It's, it's great. You've got uh, pretty regular bands at Jefferson uh, mm-hmm. Theater. You've got classic movie night, yeah, which they do a great job. Like t- uh, this coming Friday is for the kids. It's a it's Frozen, and they have the actual characters there. You can take a picture wow, with Anna really and Elsa. Cool. Yeah, they do a lot of fun stuff. They have like a VIP yeah. area, so uh, they every year they do Top Gun and people dress up. Yeah. In, 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 in the, <laughs> yeah, in the that's right. They do. I think. Yeah. yeah. So did you see the uh, Justin Bieber challenge Tom Cruise? I saw to you post it? something about yeah. that. I'm just like, why? Co- <laughs> I don't know because I'm I'm confused. I didn't even know that Justin Bieber was a like a martial arts enthusiast I, I, at all. I, I really don't think he has a capability to to harm a fly. <laughs> Not at all, and, and especially Tom Cruise, who's does most of his own stunts in in those movies. Yeah. You know, when he's in Mission Impossible and they do the fight scenes, uh, there's not a lot of times where he has a stuntman. And I know it's Hollywood. You know, it's what they they used to say that about Bruce Lee is that, you know, Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris was a legitimate uh, athlete champion. Like, he fought in tournaments, and he also happened to be an actor. Right. Whereas Bruce Lee was just an actor. Right. You know, obviously, you wouldn't want to fight him because he was, you know, faster than lightning. Yeah. But he never did, like, an actual, you know, competitive tournament. But... Tom Cruise has, like, grown man strength, you know, and Bieber's a kid. So it's just, I, I don't understand the motive behind it. But I, but from what I've read, Tom was like, okay, 
Yeah. Lego. I just, that's, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even glorify it with a response. <laughs> yeah. I would watch it, though. And, and I absolutely would. <laughs> uh, Tom Cruise also has special powers, of course. He's got the Church of Scientology that's like, right. behind him. That's right, you know, yeah. The, the, the religion that was founded by a science fiction author. Yeah. And is tax exempt. Is it really? There's, they have so much money. Because, you know, some think of some of the Scientologists are Tom Cruise, John Travolta, and the amount of money that they have to throw into Scientology. They lawyered up so hard against the, the government and the IRS to become tax-exempt. Wow. And, and so they have tax-exempt status. Gosh. And they're a recognized religion. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the things that come out nowadays in the news really don't surprise me anymore. Yep. Sadly. And the Bieber crew thing was just one of them. I was just like, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been like, wow, this is like, I would have paid attention to it. But now I'm just mm-hmm. like, it doesn't shock me anymore. You know, yeah. like the catch me outside girl. How about that? Oh, man. It's like what? we make stupid people famous. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's why I get positive responses with my podcast. And I tell, I tell the guests all the time, uh, I know, you know, certain friends that they have really interesting stories and they don't think that they're interesting themselves. And I say, hey, you have a really cool story. I would love to have you on the podcast and kind of talk about these things. And they're like, oh, nobody's going to care about that. I was like, no, no, no. You'd be shocked. You don't understand. America made a girl viral for going on Dr. Phil and saying, catch me outside. Like, How about that? <laughs> there, there are people that find things far less interesting than what your story is. You know? Yeah, so. and you know, your, your past guests so far on your podcast, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I listened to all of them twice because it was just, you know, I actually took something from that and applied it to my life. And to me, that's just like, that's what I think people need to be doing in small communities like Beaumont is tell each other stories because mm-hmm. we all have something to learn about. We all have something that we can, we can talk to about each other. Yeah. There's always something that you can learn from one of my episodes is what I try to put out there. Yeah. Uh, you're you know, right. You're a hundred percent right. Yeah. If, if there's, if there's nothing else you get from it, I guarantee you that each guest I strategically pick and kind of place uh, certain, situ- you know, certain scenarios and certain topics that I want to talk about. There's always something that you can bring yeah. bring home as a takeaway. Absolutely. So, but yeah, speaking of podcasts, there's uh, another group coming in here. Shout yes. out to Box of Content. They're gonna uh, hit up the studio in about ten minutes. So let's wrap this up. What's All the right. What's the next big thing for Brian S? Man, I don't know, dude. I think uh, MakeMatch.com great again. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna. Uh, I'll tag you on social media. You can slide into those DMs. You got to let me know how many you get. It's going right, to yeah. be some crazy ones. We'll, we'll do some quantitative I, I research on I don't think that... It. Now, Now men are notorious for sending explicit pictures. But <laughs> for some reason, it doesn't happen the other way. You know, you don't really see a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole level of, of craziness, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, so for the ladies out there, you're going to have to impress Brian with your brains and your body. Yeah. He's looking for the, where the, where the intelligent girl's at. Where yeah, you at? No, where y'all exist. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, so if you're down for, if you're down for, uh, war history, uh, it would, just a well-rounded in. Yeah. You want to watch some history channel, listen to some bagpipes. There, there's, there's going to be something. This is the guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Hey, we'll see you next time. You're All welcome right. back. Uh, with, you know, there's going to be so many things going on in your life in the next year. We'll definitely have to circle back and yeah, let's pick do up. It. For sure. All right. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Thanks a lot for coming in, Brian. That was very educational. And hey, Brian's another member of the Southeast Texas Young Professionals Organizations. A lot of those people coming through here on the podcast. So don't forget to send in those nominations for the 40 Under 40 Southeast Texas Young Professionals Organization. Their nominations are due August 13th. You can go online to the Beaumont Chambers website, Google Southeast Texas Young Professionals, Google SETX YPO. You'll find all the links that you need to nominate someone that's ages 21 to 39 out there in the business community doing good things in the Golden Triangle. I'm Tyler, host of the Tyler Knows Everything podcast, where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. We'll see you next time. <laughs>